this is Merlin. Thank you for joining us here at Lucky, an East Village neighborhood bar with an eclectic clientele. For Stonewall at 50, CUNY TV focuses on some of the highlights and historic changes the LGBTQI plus community has experienced in the last 50 years. We will learn about the changing perceptions of our community in American theater after Stonewall and find ways we can preserve our proud history and personal stories with intergenerational storytelling. But first, I want to thank the entire LGBTQI plus community and New York City for contributing to one of the largest peaceful gatherings I have ever witnessed in my life. A local newspaper reported that 150,000 people marched and another 2.5 million people may have participated in events around the 2019 Pride Parade. That means millions of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, intersex plus, and our families, friends, and allies came out for this 50th anniversary of Stonewall. To start, Let's take a look at the evolution of queer characters in American theater after Stonewall with Donna Hanover and Patrick Pacheco at Shea Josephine's on 42nd Street. I'm Donna Hanover and I am here with Patrick Pacheco, best-selling author of American Theater Wing and Oral History, and he writes frequently about LGBTQ issues. Patrick, people would be surprised at how far back you can go if you're asked the question, what are the seminal plays about the LGBTQ experience? It's extraordinary. You can actually go back to 1926 in a play called The Captive, which had just the most veiled reference whatsoever to lesbianism, totally off stage, and yet it was busted on a morals charge, brought up on charges that were later dismissed. What's significant about that is that the lead actress was a woman named Helen Menken who later led the American theater wing. The Captive got busted the same night as Sex by Mae West and both were brought up on morals charges wow. and both were dismissed and it made Mae West a tremendous star. I know that you've said it's very hard to winnow it down but in the modern era there are four plays that are really significant uh, the Boys in the Band, Torch Song Trilogy, The Normal Heart, and Angels in America, right? That's absolutely true. Uh, there's a whole list of other ones, of course, uh, that we can talk about. But in the interest of time, it's best to sort of concentrate and focus on that because they had a tremendous impact both on the gay community and the public at large. So what has happened to the gay play in the last 50 years? The short answer, Donna, is that it's grown up. It's gone from internalized, self-loathing homophobia to uh, triumphant, um, uh, don't mess with me uh, power. It's gone from being defined by our sexuality to plays about love, intimacy, compassion, marriage, and even gay adoption. It's gone from casts of actors who were afraid that if they were in a gay play, their careers would be ruined to cast of actors who are proud to be in a revival of a gay play like Boys in the Band, which was an all-gay cast. And it's gone from playwrights who happen to be gay writing about gay-themed plays that are as universal as anything else out there. So the Boys in the Band actually premiered off-Broadway the year before Stonewall, 68. That, that's right. It was a tremendous ground breaking play. Uh, nobody had ever seen anything like it. The images of gay prior to that, in terms of entertainment, were people like Paul Lind, Liberace, and Charles Nelson Riley. So to be confronted with a bunch of gay men in an Upper East Side apartment celebrating a birthday, in which there was a school teacher, yes, an interior designer, uh, and a, a, a whole host of different professionals gathered together in one room talking about their relationships, talking about sexuality, and uh, is sort of presenting for the first time um, homosexuality in a way that had never quite been seen before. It became a cause celebre with people like Jackie Kennedy Onassis coming down to see it and bringing her socialite friends with Truman Capote, with, uh, with everybody else coming down to this small off-Broadway play. And it went on for quite a long time, two or three years. The playwright Mark Crowley uh, was very brave in doing that. 
and what was significant about it is that yes, it was bitchy and yes, it was self-loathing and there was a line by the lead actor, Michael, who is the host of the party, that says, if only we can learn not to hate each other so much. And that sparked a great controversy within the gay community. Fast forward to 1978, Torch Song Trilogy. What was that about? The interesting thing about what Harvey Firestein did is you're absolutely right. It started at the, all these off-off Broadway theaters, La Mama, International Study. It was a three-part uh, epic uh, starring, again, a drag queen, a torch singer played by Harvey Firestein. It brought him to the public consciousness in a huge way. And it sort of just sort of eked out this existence. It was playing to half houses, John Glines, who was one of the early pioneers of gay theater, picked it up, supported it, gave Harvey money to continue it. Ellen Stewart at La Mama helped nurture it as well. It was a three-part epic that you would have thought would never see the light of day on Broadway. And yet in 1982, it was brought to Broadway, and not only was it had a long run on Broadway, but it also won the Tony Award. And its themes, again, were from somebody who was out and proud and wanted to show that as Harvey says uh, in his character, people think that homosexuals cannot love. And that play was all about the love that he had for this bisexual man who was trying to decide whether he was going to stay with his wife or go with Harvey's character. And also the love that he and his mother had, as contentious as it was, and also the love that he had for a young gay teen that he adopted, who in the original production was played by Matthew Broderick. So uh, these were new themes that were coming up in 82, and it went all the way to win a Tony Award as Best Play and also a Tony Award for Harvey Firestein in the lead role. And again, it was groundbreaking. And again, it showed the general public an image of gay men that they had never had before. The gay men are capable of love and that they are capable of marriage and adoption. And that was 37 years ago. And then <clears throat> the AIDS epidemic struck. And what we have is the normal heart. Larry Kramer. Right. This was fascinating because in the midst of this epidemic that was killing gay men and other communities as well, the Haitian community, and in this autobiographical play, Larry Kramer, the author, looks back at a time when he created the gay men's health crisis with other people in the midst of this terrifying epidemic. And what had occurred at that time is that Larry was absolutely balls out uh, uh, activist in terms of calling the government um, to task, uh, indicting it in the most ferocious language for its inability to address the AIDS crisis, both the federal government and the Ed Koch um, you know, city government. Larry Kramer was even mad at the gay men's health crisis. There was this tension uh, between Larry Kramer is this sort of Old Testament prophet screaming about the AIDS epidemic that was just really in, three years into its terrifying run um, about both toward the gay community and to the general public that they were not paying it sufficient attention. And this was pitted against other uh, people who wanted a more conciliatory approach. They thought they could get more progress against what was a death sentence. If you had AIDS, you had it. It was a death sentence. It was beyond. It was beyond terrifying. What came next about five years down the road was Angels in America by Tony Kushner. It was this political and philosophical seven-hour epic in two parts that Tony Kushner had begun writing in the late uh, parts of the Reagan administration and continued, and it finally debuted in the Clinton administration, interestingly enough. Within this kind of microcosm of relationship, Tony Kushner then goes on to explore politics, philosophy, religion, of uh, the power of, of God or the lack of power. At one point he even says, you know, we should take um, up uh, and sue God for abandonment. Did you die? No, I'm here on business. <laughs> and certainly people that were dealing with AIDS at the time and losing their friends felt that God had abandoned them. And yet there was this hopeful message that Tony Kushner created because prior does survive. We had gone from the, the, the uh, killing fields of the normal heart to AZT and the fact that 
it would continue, that the, you know, the tribe would continue, gay men would continue, and gay women would continue, and, and there, were, there was a great deal of compassion and conciliation within the play as well. One of the subplots of Angels in America was the story of Harper, the wife, who was obviously very unfulfilled because her husband, in fact, loved her, but not as a husband would love a wife. And so she felt very um, inadequate to say the least, and she became a drug addict and, and so on. I remember seeing this initially, and I had some feeling of identification with her because it, it was kind of revelatory that when people are forced in the closet and therefore have marriages for show, the other person also suffers. So this dealt with so, so many themes, and it won the Pulitzer. It won every award you in the book. But you brought up a very good point, which is that when, and, and this is central to a lot of gay plays, when there is repression, the id leaks out in the most damaging ways, and there's a lot of collateral damage. And you brought that point up beautifully. It was wrong of me to marry you. I knew you. It's a sin, and it's killing us both. The other thing that is lovely about um, Angels in America is the relationship between Pryor and Joe Pitt's Mormon mother. Um, and that was at one point, uh, she says, um, don't make assumptions about me and I won't make assumptions about you. And that is the beginning of a beautiful relationship between, between the two of them that last until the end of the play. So that again was Tony Kushner's talking about communicate connect. Just open your, your hearts and your minds to people that you don't think you're going to get along with. You'll find, my friend, that what you love will take you places you never dreamed you'd go. I think the last line of Angels in America, which says the great work continues, the great work continues in gay playwrights and lesbian playwrights and transgendered actors. I know that you feel moving forward, Fun Home is something that is a very significant production. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, our sisters, our lesbian sisters, have gotten short shrift in the theater. Uh, for some reason, everything seemed to generate toward gay relationships, male relationships. The, the miracle, the great miracle of Fun Home was that again it started at the public theater where a lot of these plays started and it was nurtured very carefully with Lisa Krohn and Janine Tesori taking this Alison Bechdel uh, graphic comic that she had created about her father who was a gay man, a closeted gay man, having to deal with that as she herself is coming out of the closet and uh, you know falling in love in college. And I, it goes to the point that you had made earlier that repression, when, when it is there, it leaks out in damaging ways and Bruce commits, ultimately commits suicide. And it's a young woman trying to come to terms with her father's closeted personality and persona and what it leads to. My dad and I both grew up in the same small Pennsylvania town. And he was gay and I was gay and he killed himself. And I became a lesbian cartoonist. And then you have black playwrights like Jeremy O. Harris, who is addressing interracial black and white relationships in plays like The Slave Play and in Daddy, uh, which recently had a run off Broadway. And you have writers like Terrell Alvin McCraney addressing what homophobia is and homosexuality is within the black community. I know that we've left out some of the fantastic musicals that deal with LGBTQ uh, issues. Rent, La Cage aux Folles, Kinky Boots. Kinky Boots. Uh, that's Harvey uh, again, to some extent. It's, it's great that Harvey has become quote unquote mainstream. I don't know if he would think of himself as mainstream, but I think what you have to acknowledge is the great debt that we owe these playwrights gay and lesbian, and these transgendered actors that, we've, uh, that have now been in plays like Gene Lee's Straight White Men. I think what's important is to acknowledge the great bravery of these writers and actors as we've progressed from Mark Crowley to Harvey Firestein to Larry Kramer 
to Tony Kushner, to Matthew Lopez, to Terrell Alvin McCraney, et cetera, and so forth. Because it was hard to be out there, certainly in the early years. Um, it, it was not easy. It could have invited, I'm sure it invited lots of hate mail. Uh, and yet they continued because it was important for this community to have a voice and to show it in all of its prismatic uh, beauty. So as Tony Kushner wrote, the great work continues. Yes, amen to that. <laughs> And now, let's turn our attention to something each of us could do to foster understanding and cooperation within the LGBTQI plus community and beyond. We can learn to communicate better and share our stories. And just how do we do that? Wes Enos, founder of Generations Project, leads the way with intergenerational storytelling. The word that I keep hearing around you is intergenerational. Where did that come from? I come from a small town in Oregon where most of my life I was involved with the church growing up and without realizing it there were all these older members in the community watching me grow up in this very small town on the Oregon coast. And when I graduated from high school I had all this support I never even knew and, and it really impacted me and helped shape my life and then when I moved to San Francisco, came out, I immediately made older friends by working and living in the Castro district. And then when I moved to New York City, I did not have that experience at all. And I really craved having older role models in my life and didn't know how to help bridge that gap between older and younger LGBTQ people. You have your own community now. Yeah, I've been growing a community in New York City since I got here, yeah. but it certainly takes time. There is queer families that develop, but that's after a great struggle that is an individual kind of a lonely experience. Does the Generations Project encourage participation to create an elevator speech? This is optional. <laughs> Wait, would you like to hear my elevator pitch? That's yes, I do <laughs> want to hear your elevator well, speech. Well, the, the Generations Project is a nonprofit organization based here in New York City. Our mission is to preserve the history of the LGBTQ movement and to promote intergenerational support through storytelling. So essentially, we facilitate intergenerational storytelling programs and produce and film live storytelling events to share and document LGBT history to people of all ages. We're talking early 1960s. There's no role models, there's no movement, there's no community, there's no identity. Who comes to your storytelling events? Well, we welcome people of all ages at our storytelling events. It's really important for us to inspire people of all ages to come and learn LGBTQ history because we feel LGBT history is not often taught to us in schools. Our families don't often speak to us about it. And it, this history certainly is not just given to us when we come to terms of being gay or LGBTQ or an ally. So how are we supposed to learn it? So we certainly welcome everyone from all walks of life to, to our events. Even though I was as close to my mother as I was, it took me a while to be able to tell her that because of the stigma that I internalized. And as I tell people now, HIV will not kill you, but stigma will. How does one join in? Well, there are a number of ways. We have a website at thegenerationsproject.org where people can join our mailing list. I Mo saw that. Most of our events are free and a lot of times people can just show up. Some of them require an RSVP. We are constantly recruiting people to join our intergenerational storytelling workshops, which are becoming the bulk of our programming. We have found that bringing a group of 12 people, 12 LGBTQ people or allies of all ages together who meet one day a week for four weeks to help each other develop a five minute story up that is historical, and personal and related to an LGBT historical subject that we're focusing on. <clears throat> and during that time, the group meets with one another, helps each other develop a story, and then shares their story in the last day of the workshop to a small audience. And we're, we're, we're always looking for people to participate in that and who can commit to attending all four days of the workshop for the it's four weeks. It's a day's worth of work or a couple of hours each day? Each workshop is about two to three hours long. 
Uh, okay. One and day a week for four weeks. So you teach people how to speak or give them an outline of how to, how to tell their story? Yeah, we give them an outline on how to share a five-minute story. We help them develop five major points of their story. And we do group work to help older and younger people understand what each generation would benefit from hearing while they share their story or how to help paraphrase 80 years of life into a, a five minute wow. story. Wow, that and sounds like exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting and it's really rewarding to see older and younger people help each other develop a, their story. And it, most importantly, it helps us build a community leading up to our storytelling events, which is the greatest uh, impact that our organization has. That it's not all on me or our, our community to get people to our events. Our storytelling workshop participants become promoters as well. Yes. Because our participants are excited to hear their friends or people they've worked with share stories at our other live storytelling events. That's wonderful. I have actually heard my story in your promotional material about the friends no longer at breakfast at the restaurant in San Francisco. The moment that really changed the way I viewed the community and that was when I was working at a home restaurant and I was telling a coworker, I, I don't want to be like one of those older gay men eating breakfast by themselves every morning. And he just basically said, that person there used to have friends just like you. They used to go out all night and then they'd go have breakfast with all their friends just like you do. And now they're all dead and now there's just him eating breakfast there. And I've never forgot that moment. And for me, that's when the Generations Project was really born because I wanted to do everything to learn about that. When it comes to storytelling, especially intergenerational storytelling, if we're hearing someone share their story on stage, many of us can resonate with a little bit with their story and it, we can identify with that person and it, storytelling humanizes all of us to realize a lot of us have had similar experiences and overcome similar obstacles and, and it unites us. It kind of opens your eyes to how hard people have to fight just to be who they are. It made me take being part of the LGBT community a lot more seriously. There's a little pitch for the Stonewall 50 time capsule. Would you what like to hear is? that? There's an elevator yes, pitch for that please. also. So the Stonewall 50 time capsule will be built in collaboration with the New York Historical Society between now and June 2020. And the Stonewall 50 time capsule itself will be a physical manifestation of the LGBTQ movement created by printing photos and creating handwritten messages and stories to attach to the photos for people to, for no one to see until the time capsule itself is opened in the year 2069 for the 100th anniversary of Stonewall. So it'll be stored for 50 years at the New York Historical Society. Stonewall was in June 69, and a few months later, I'm with a group of people. We talked about how the split in our life was really hurting us, that we had our uh, sexual life, and then there was our other life. We are taking the stories told at our live events and then transcribing them and essentially tagging common phrases and years and organizing them in our own archive. And then through that process, we're creating quotes of those storytellers and attaching quotes of our storytellers with a photo of our storyteller. And that's the content we're putting into the time capsule. And we actually go to the storyteller themselves and ask them to handwrite their quote. Everything that goes into the Stonewall 50 time capsule will be uh, handwritten. You're also working with Sage on a yearly time capsule? We love our partnership with Sage. It's a great resource for us and we're able to develop certain programs that work with the Sage staff. And one of the programs we've developed was creating the Sage Living time capsule, which is a time capsule that's opened every year at the beginning of the year and the purpose of that is to not only preserve our history but to foster intergenerational connections on an annual basis at the beginning of the year by bringing different generations together to actually create something together take a photo together we print it we'll put it in the time capsule and each year the community grows and grows and and opens the time capsule and can read what they wrote to each other the year before they can add a new uh, envelope with a message to it for the next year or future year. So it's a really great way to help us sustain some of the intergenerational connections. Do you have a 
something you would like to say to the kids out there or people that are looking for this kind of experience where they can actually learn to express themselves? Well, I guess I would like everyone to go easy on each other. A lot, a lot of young people don't know LGBT history and it's not their fault. And the only way we can really learn it is if the older generation, or the older generation steps up or takes the time to share that history with the, the next generation. And in return, the younger generation needs to be open to learning history. And also it's important that regardless of our age, both generations have a desire or an untapped interest to learn from one another. So I'd just like to encourage everyone to be open-minded and, and understand that we do have a lot of differences between our age ranges, but we also have a lot to learn from one another. And our history connects us. I hope you've enjoyed Stonewall at 50, a CUNY TV special celebrating Pride 2019. We explored the changes in American theater after Stonewall with Donna Hanover and Patrick Pacheco while Wes Enos from the Generations Project explained how intergenerational storytelling can preserve LGBTQI plus history. This is Merlin. See you next time, and thank you for joining us. Happy Pride! Out of the